Uh, we are very pleased to introduce Ambassador uh, Mark Metz. Uh, we are going to be interviewing him today about some aspects of cultural diplomacy that he spoke about in his speech. So thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you. Um, our first question are, what are the strategic sectors of Danish culture and what do you think Danish culture is known for abroad? Well, good question. There are strategic sectors. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, when, when you run a tiny little operation like the Danish Cultural Institute, you have to focus. You cannot cover the whole world mm -hmm. and you cannot cover all themes. So we have had to set some areas as our priority focus based on one, areas where there are some specific Danish qualities that we already have felt an international interest for. You know, we, we would not start out by trying to sell our language. That's a mess. I mean, we're only five million people who speak it, so we don't necessarily spend too much time selling our language abroad. But we know, for example, that the way we have developed uh, our little nation, uh, we are pretty good at handling everything that has to do with children and young people. Uh, I don't know how long time you've been here, but if you, if you walk around uh, and experience Danish children culture in theater, in the way we handled the schooling system, in the social relations built up between children and between children and parents. Uh, there are some very interesting patterns. Uh, Danes, grown up Danes, and also little Danes, are all of them in many ways a funny individualistic, sometimes even anarchistic kind of people. Uh, and in spite of, an, of, of a very well-disciplined, very well-organized, luxurious welfare state, we have within a state that is strong and which is generating some kind of, of, of minimum equality between people um, and a very high degree of, of wealth generally and wealth distributed. Within that system, which is highly regulated, we have maintained the, the, the capacity to be anarchistic, to be creative, to ask questions about why do we do this that way, couldn't we do it in some other way. So, and I think that ability to have something which is at the same time well organized, predictable, non-corrupt, friendly and open, and then also have the anarchistic creativity. Mm -hmm. That is something that many <coughs> countries and partners around the world like to investigate a little bit more by experiencing parts of Danish child and young people culture. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, we're planning a huge effort at showing a number of, of, of aspects of Danish culture in China. And that's a big market, I mean, mm -hmm. tiny little Denmark and huge China. And we could not in any way have an ambition to show China everything and they wouldn't care anyway. But there's areas where they are interested and children, education, culture that has to do with children is fascinating them. And it's, it's probably partially because they have a, they've had a one-child policy Mm -hmm. They've had an educational system where education has been, you know, very disciplined, very strict. You really have to learn things, very competitive also. Um, and then they experience this strange little country uh, where there's not a lot of discipline, especially not in the school system, but a lot of creative learning mm -hmm. and a lot of developments for new ideas in many ways. And, and, and every nation, big or small, need to be able also to cultivate some kind of dynamics from people who think in a little bit different way than everybody else. If everybody thinks the same, there's no development. It just petrifies and the systems kind of run out of energy. So, so um, we feel a huge interest from abroad in Danish children culture. That's, and that's pretty good. 
That's pretty good. We're proud of it. Yeah, yeah. that's really and interesting. Then we do a lot on sustainability. Um, we don't want to leave Mother Earth in such a rotten shape that mm -hmm. your children and grandchildren won't have a wonderful place to live also. And so I think we, we owe it to the future generations to, to use all, all the tricks in the game book, also tricks that can be played out between people of culture and creative industries and what have you, in order to try to change the frame of mind of those that think that growth and growth and growth and further abuse of resources that are limited, that that process can go on and on. It cannot. Everybody knows. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we're working quite a lot in the gray areas between culture, sustainability, and, and, and traditional economic growth, uh, trying to, to modify the, the stupidity of being run mm -hmm. by just one ideology, which is the growth ideology. We don't see growth as the God in our gospel. We see sustainability as a necessity. Interesting, thank you. I also, when I think of Denmark, I always think of the welfare state. Yeah. Um, how do you think that influences uh, your cultural diplomacy around the world? Do you think that that's a really big factor? No, no. I don't necessarily think so. I think the, the, the welfare state as a broad headline mm -hmm. uh, can maybe create a little bit of attention, but the, the, the things that trigger the real attention that also then ignites uh, some kind of dialogue between people mm -hmm. uh, is not the broad title of the welfare state. The welfare state, I think to most people, sounds pretty boring. It has to do with rules and regulations and a lot of tax that has to be paid. Uh, what triggers is, is some of the consequences of having been lucky enough over many years to have enough resources to do a redistribution of resources so that those that don't have enough get a little bit more and those that have too much pay a little bit more. Uh, and that redistribution of resources has led to a society where, where there is a freedom to express yourself freely and develop yourself freely. And that again has created as I mentioned before, a special way of handling children, mm -hmm. s seeing them not as kids, but as normal people, mm -hmm. small adults that have to be taken seriously. Uh, also by seeing at issues in our society uh, as something that has to be taken care of in, in a bottom-up approach, so that we, when we develop, uh, try to develop green cities like Copenhagen, sustainability in terms of how we do urban planning, then the focus is, is not the welfare state. The focus starts at the bottom. I think in many people's minds, especially if you talk to Americans, they see welfare state as some kind of semi-socialistic uh, thing where you get all kinds of stuff forced down your throat. We don't, we don't see that as, 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 the, as, the, as the, the way the welfare state looks. Mm -hmm. To us, the welfare the state looks as, as an animal you can shape from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. uh, by expressing yourself in a very open society and coming up with ideas that can make it just a little bit better all the time. And uh, talking about the influence, how uh, Anderson and Granby, if I don't pronounce it... Uh, <laughs> what? Granby? Uh, Granby? The priest and poet that uh, promote education in Denmark. What poet? Granby. Grundtvig, ah, all right. <laughs> yeah, but that's a different, that's, no, that's all right. Yeah, but that's, I mean, Danish is a funny language. Grundtvig. 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 Get How it does down your throat. Grundtvig. <laughs> How does he uh, influence uh, the Danish culture? Well, you know, culture is a funny thing. Um, one of the strange characteristics of of a people's culture to the degree that you can actually say something as sweeping as that, is that those who share that culture, they know they share it, they know what is in it, but they don't really think about it, it's just there. And that's why it's often so very difficult to have serious dialogue between people of different cultures. I don't necessarily think of my Danish culture when I 
have a dialogue with other cultures. Mm -hmm. So, and, and vice versa. Uh, so sometimes we, we need to lift ourselves out of our own culture. Uh, Grundtvig, to some degree, did that. He, he lifted, uh, he lifted, so to speak, the, well, he opened the eyes uh, to some very basic uh, interhuman relationships that were extremely important. He did it on, on a religious background, and that was kind of a modernizing project in, in a very old-fashioned way of looking at religion. Um, I'm not a religious person, so I'm, I'm not, I don't have any uh, religious affection for Grundtvig, not at all, but I, I do appreciate the way he uh, put individual rights at the center. He put a, an, a, an almost, almost violent belief in the quality and potentials of human beings and human cooperation and loving your next of kin. You know, he had some, 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 some very basic religious-based uh, uh, visions of, of how we should love each other. I mean, I don't mean physically, but how we should care for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think those parts of, of, of his uh, vision of, of interhuman relationships uh, were probably part of the foundation of a then young Danish democracy that was still not fully democratic, only men voted and only those who were rich voted. Mm -hmm. Real democracy came later, but still it, 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 it put it kind of a basic platform of respect for human rights, uh, respect for individual rights, respect for freedom and respect for learning and, and putting value on, on developing learning and developing an, an open and, and, and free thinking society. So in that way his spirit still lives. His religious spirit is probably not very active. I mean, in, in terms of religion, Denmark is, is, has, has a basic mm, Protestant structure in its mm. way of believing, but you don't see people going to churches, not that many. It's, 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 it plays a role, but it, it's kind of underground, not in political terms, underground, but it's part of the culture which is there, but we don't necessarily take it up and polish it and show it off. You know, you, mm -hmm. you don't go around in Denmark telling people how religious you are or what church you belong to. And when I moved to the US the first time, one of the first questions I got, which church do you, do you belong to? I said, well, I don't belong to a church. If I did, the church would belong to me. It's not they that own me, but if I have a relationship to a church, then it's a very personal relationship. It's not something that uh, is expressed in terms of the church owning you. But in that way, Danish religion is a very personal phenomenon, but of course it's, it's there somewhere. And talking about international relations, um, mm, several Danish government uh, have argued uh, against the idea of the cultural exception in uh, international uh, trade relations. And uh, what is your idea about it? Well, about? About the cultural exception, meaning that uh, culture shouldn't be part of the free Oh, trade. that old issue. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> the French exception. That's, that's, that's the French problem with, you know, I, 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 I don't really, I can see it as a factor in the way Europe handles its freedom of uh, movement between ideas and people and nations, uh, where some of the big European nations uh, sometimes feel it's more natural that the freedom should be one way and not both ways. Um, that's the problem if you don't take dialogue seriously, if you don't really believe in the capacity of your own culture uh, to be both adding value to somebody else's culture and at the same time picking up value from somebody else's culture. To me, if, you, if, if, you're, a little, if you're nervous of, 
of opening your world up uh, to, to dialogue, then it must be because you're a little bit too nervous about your own values and your own potential. Uh, so I, I look at that from another perspective than, than the uh, daily political problems of whether there should be a free movement of uh, whatever television series produced in the US, uh, whatever. It's, uh, to me, it's a very strange discussion, and, and I, don't really, I don't really see it as anything else than some kind of expression of uncertainty and insecurity about one's own. Mm. And uh, also in uh, the European realm, um, a lot of European countries are promoting the tax exception to, um, to promote culture and that private sectors sponsor more cultural uh, activities. So what is your point about that? Well, if you look at the way Danish culture is financed, <coughs> there's a huge public financing. Mm -hmm. um, our electronic media receive quite a lot of support in order to have a live and, 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 and educational and, and cultural strong media world. Um, I think that is a normal thing in a tiny little nation that they want to make sure politically that that the culture and the language and its literature and its authors and things like that all get best possible uh, living conditions to, to, to continue their creative efforts. Um, if I compare the daily financing to uh, most other European nations that I know, uh, there is a very, very strong influx of private funding to the Danish culture. Mm -hmm. Without the Danish cultural foundations and without the Danish companies continuously putting resources into Danish culture, most of the Danish museums would probably have to close and you would probably not see a lot of Danish plays on the Danish theatres. I mean, the, the uh, the, the creative part of the funding is typically private or foundation financed. The government financing supports the structures and the contents is typically produced in a very close cooperation between the various artistic or cultural institutions and the private and the foundation world. So there's a very, so there's, a, there's an interesting mix which probably resembles quite a lot what goes on in other nations. Look at France, it invests heavily in the physical infrastructure, mm -hmm. but a lot of the contents is based on a cooperation between different interested parties and partners, national or international, the business or, or foundation money. So I think in, in, in many ways the European nations look pretty much alike in, in the way they finance their culture. Mm -hmm. uh, we're lucky that we've had a, a strong tradition of a commitment from, from the Danish governments ever since the late 1950s probably um, of a governmental obligation uh, to make sure that, that culture is not just an elite phenomenon, but that art and culture and fine arts should be devel developed in such a way that it actually makes it possible for for anybody to to get the inspiration and the good experience and the mental and psychological development that, that arts and fine arts and culture can do. Um, and that was part of, of the early welfare state uh, where one wanted to take away a little bit of the elitism of, of culture mm -hmm. and, and make sure that it was also something that normal people could enjoy. Well, and to conclude the, the interview, um, you are Secretary General of the uh, Dansk Institute, uh, Danish, Institute. Danish Cultural Institute. Yeah, you've been here long <laughs> enough to speak pretty good Danish by now. And, uh, Except Gondvi, that is different. <laughs> and um, you have presence in, uh, in a lot of countries. Um, how do you develop the, the cultural diplomacy or the soft diplomacy, as you <laughs> call it? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, there are many, many explanations. There's not one explanation. It has, the way you handle your relations to, to other people, 
I think that's where, where it starts for all of us. Um, when I was a young boy, I always got into fights because I always kind of ended up in the schoolyard where some big kids were beating up some small kids. And then I thought it's stupid those big kids beat up the small kids. And then I tried to help the small kids beat up the big kids. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I always uh, broke my glasses and broke my teeth and had uh, torn my shirts and things like that. And gradually, when I became older and, and big enough, uh, not necessarily to get into fights anymore, I, I continued to try to solve conflicts between people by, by talking to them, by, by dialogue. And, and, and ended up in the, the diplomatic world as a natural consequence, probably not because I love diplomacy, but because I love to try to, to solve interhuman and intergovernmental issues by, by negotiating, by finding solutions. We do not necessarily have one winner. It's not a zero-sum game, but where everybody comes out of a dialogue with a little bit of a winning edge. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And that's where you, what you see today in so many places in the world where conflicts have a tendency to become extremely awful and extremely wild and hard and killing and whatever. Um, and if you don't remember, no matter how tough it is, to hold on to the country principle of dialogue, then the world will never get better. So that's why I got into diplomacy, because I thought I could help to make the world a little bit better. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for being here with us okay. today. We really appreciate it. You're welcome.